We are coming upon the time of Thanksgiving. And as we come to the national holiday of Thanksgiving, we know that there's an awful lot of mythology that we grew up with about what happened on that first Thanksgiving. And today we have for you a scholar who has tried to look at what really happened at that time and put the history up against the mythology and tell, talk to us about what, what is the real story uh, during that time. Uh, David, David Silverman is a professor of history at George Washington University. Um, Sam will make sure that I say that you got your master's from William and Mary because that's Sam's alma mater. So he wants to make sure we get that. Um, although you did earn your, Prince, uh, your Princeton PhD. So you, you get a little bit of props for both places. Um, and the most recent book, uh, which we will share with you um, in the follow-up note, is called This Land is Their Land, The Wampanoag Indians, Plymouth Colony, and the Troubled History of Thanksgiving. Uh, the book was published in 2019, and Professor Silverman has become sort of the one of the go-to scholars uh, as Thanksgiving comes around. So we are extremely honored that he has decided to devote his time and talent to us uh, right now for the next hour. And so we are delighted to move forward. Uh, Professor Silverman, tell us the real story of Thanksgiving. Well, I'll do my best and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm honored to be here uh, with all of you so we can think together about uh, these these issues. Um, I'm going to put up a uh, slide presentation now to accompany my comments. So if you will bear with me for just a moment here. All right. Just a second. All right, there we go. Um, before I launch into the content of, of today's talk, uh, let me just include some preliminary remarks that address uh, the terminology that I'm going to be using um, today. Just a moment here. You're gonna see in the, the title of my book, and you're gonna hear in my comments here today um, that occasionally I use the term Indians. And I realize, of course, that this term is a misnomer. Um, after all, uh, the United States is not India. <laughs> um, and I realize that this is a, a word that has become increasingly jarring to segments of, of the public um, who have been taught that the word is not only inaccurate, but racially insensitive. The reason I use this term in my book and in my talk is that over the course of my 20 plus year career researching Native American history, most, certainly not all, but most of the indigenous people with whom I've come into contact have told me that that's the term they prefer when referring to them in the aggregate. Now, let me also be clear, um, almost to a person, they prefer tribal names when, when it's possible to use them. But the point is that over the centuries, Native people have appropriated this term and turned it into a source of pride. And so who am I to tell them to do otherwise? It's out of deference, not indifference to them that I use this word. And so with that, for generations, Americans have been telling themselves, themselves a patriotic story of the supposed first Thanksgiving that treats colonization as a consensual bloodless affair. In this tale, and I'm sure most, if not all of you are familiar with it, the pilgrims, religious dissenters from England, cram aboard the Mayflower to brave the stormy Atlantic in search of freedom of conscience in America. These sea-tossed adventurers land off Cape Cod with a fresh copy of their proto-constitution, the Mayflower Compact, and after some fruitless exploring and brief confrontations with the natives, they decide to found their settlement up the coast at a place they call Plymouth. 
Yet the future of the colony is very much in doubt during its first couple of months, because the Indians, rarely identified by tribe, on whom the English know they must depend for food and protection, seem to be at best wary and shy, and at worst, hostile. However, eventually the natives reach out to the newcomers through the interpreters Samoset and Squanto. The story sidesteps the obvious question of how these figures managed to learn English, nor does it explain why the Indians were suddenly so friendly. The native's chief, Usamequin, who the English know by his title, Massasoit, even agrees to a treaty of alliance with Plymouth. Over the spring and summer, the Indians feed the pilgrims and teach them how to plant corn and where to fish, whereupon the colony begins to thrive. That fall, the two parties seal their friendship with the famous First Thanksgiving. The peace that follows permits colonial New England and by extension, modern America to become blessed seats of freedom, democracy, Christianity, and plenty. As for what happens to the Indians next, this story has nothing to say. The Indians' legacy is to present America as a gift to white people, or in other words, to concede to colonialism. Like Pocahontas and Sacagawea, the other famous Indians of early American history, they help the colonizers and then move off stage. The Wampanoags of what is now southeastern Massachusetts, who are the Indians in this drama, have long contended that this tale is not history, but a myth that sugarcoats the viciousness of colonialism for indigenous people. My book reckons with this uncomfortable assertion and its implications. And thus, you'll have plenty of material after this talk today to ruin your family's Thanksgiving. I realize that many of you are perfectly capable of ruining your family's Thanksgiving without any assistance from me, but all the same. So for instance, in traditional accounts of Thanksgiving, the pilgrims step onto Plymouth Rock and into a new world or wilderness. But in fact, human civilization in the Americas was every bit as rich and ancient as in Europe. History did not begin for the Wampanoags with the Mayflower. They already had a dynamic past, countless generations old, that shaped who they were and what they did. In other words, they inhabited an old world. And the so-called wilderness in which the English arrived was full of villages, roads, cornfields, historic monuments, cemeteries, and forests cleared of underbrush through controlled burns, all by native design. And you can get a sense of what I'm talking about here in this drawing of the Wampanoag community of Patuxet, which was located on the very site that Plymouth Colony would be built. And this is drawn by the French explorer Samuel de Champlain in 1605, 15 years before the pilgrim's arrival. The Wampanoag's recent history mattered too. Though the Thanksgiving myth suggests that the pilgrim Wampanoag encounter was a first contact episode, in fact, it was just one in a long string of bloody meetings between the Wampanoags and Europeans since 1524. So in other words, a century before the arrival of the Mayflower. And those bloody contacts took place with increasing frequency from 1602 onward, as yet another drawing by Samuel de Champlain captures. The Thanksgiving myth portrays the Wampanoags as timid and overawed by the English. But I show that the Wampanoags were easily the stronger party during Plymouth's early years. The English did not dictate to the Wampanoags. Instead, the Wampanoags initially used Plymouth Colony as a pawn in their domestic and intertribal politics. It will come as a surprise perhaps to most of you that the celebrated first Thanksgiving feast actually played a minor role in this relationship, far more influential 
were a series of other less palatable episodes filled with violence and power politics. I also submit that our emphasis on the nearly 50 years of peace following the first Thanksgiving and its associated treaty of 1621 elides the more important point that the Wampanoags came to resent the colonists' aggressive and often underhanded expansion. The truth is that the English and the Wampanoags nearly came to blows repeatedly during that supposed long peace, culminating in the terrible King Philip's War of 1675-76. Most histories that bother to include the Wampanoags end with this war, but my book contends that accounting with the Thanksgiving myth as a white lie requires tracing Wampanoag struggles with colonialism through the centuries right up to the present day. Long-term historical perspectives like these are especially urgent as modern America grapples with new manifestations of white nationalism, while at the very same time, indigenous Americans in New England and indeed all across the country are reasserting their political, economic, and cultural sovereignty. Histories like this will help us to better understand these trends. So to explore these themes today, I'm gonna to focus this talk around two cases spread across the centuries in which Wampanoags posed counter narratives to white Americans triumphalist histories. And our first revisionist historian is none other than the Wampanoag sachem or chief Pometacom, better known to history as King Philip, as in King Philip's War. In the late spring of 1675, some 50 years after his father, Usamequin or Massasoit, had greeted the pilgrims, Pometacom sat down to talk with the delegation of English magistrates from the colony of Rhode Island. So here's Wampanoag country, and this is the location where this conversation took place. The Rhode Islanders were there to encourage the sachem or chief to agree to a peaceful arbitration of the Wampanoag's mounting differences with Plymouth Colony. Yet Pometacom had already resolved to fight and agreed to this conference only to explain why. Let's take a moment to consider what he said that day. And by the way, the account of this conversation is one of these rare gems in the documentary record in which we, it seems that we can really hear a Native American voice without excess editorial um, uh, uh, sanitizing. So Pometacom said that he viewed the history of Wampanoag English relations as little more than the colonists' failure to live up to the promise of the 1621 alliance. The sachem recalled that when the pilgrims first settled at Plymouth, 55 years earlier, Usamequin, and I quote here, was as a great man and the English as a little child. Pometacom contended that his father Usamequin could have wiped out the infant colony if he had wished. Instead, he held back its native enemies, fed the starving colonists, and granted them land. Now, Pometacom conveniently left out that his father had made this choice less out of altruism or friendliness, as the Thanksgiving myth would, would contend, than out of a need for allies. The Wampanoags had been hobbled by a plague between the years 1616 and 1619, whereupon their Narragansett rivals to the West began subjugating them. But generally, Pometacom was correct here that Plymouth would have become yet another in a long series of English lost colonies if it hadn't been for Wampanoag largesse. And how did Plymouth show its gratitude decades later, now that it had become the great man and the Wampanoags a little child? Pometacom denounced, and I quote here, that in English courts, if 20 honest Indians testified that an Englishman had done them wrong, it was as nothing. But if one of the worst Indians testified against any Indian suspected by the English, that was sufficient. Furthermore, the English had begun to interfere in criminal matters between Wampanoags within Wampanoag territory, 
including recently executing three of Pemeticom's leading men for the supposed assassination of a Christian Wampanoag who had been leaking Wampanoag intelligence to the English. Pemeticom fumed that, and I quote again, whatever was only between Indians and not in English townships, they would not have us prosecute. About half of the Wampanoags, mostly on Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, had adopted Christianity and sworn off Pemeticom's leadership, as well as the responsibility to pay him tribute. They feared no reprisal from the sachem because they enjoyed English protection by virtue of their Christianity. And as if all this was not enough, there were still other issues. The English used land deeds, some fair, some foul, to claim Wampanoag territory for their own exclusive use under their own exclusive jurisdiction. Well, this ran contrary to the natives' expectation that their land sales merely conveyed permission for the English to settle among them under their customs, Wampanoag customs. In other words, they expected that the English were buying into Wampanoag society rather than buying the land from out of Wampanoag society. When Indians resisted, colonists flooded the contested tracts with livestock and slapped any Indians who injured the animals with trumped up criminal fines and lawsuits. The point was to force holdout natives to release their claims and resign themselves to the English interpretation of these land sales. Such machinations gave the colonists, as Pemeticom put it, 100 times more land than now the king, meaning Pemeticom himself, had for his people. To the Wampanoags then, expanding English law was nothing more than a shakedown by people with short memories and thin loyalty. The Rhode Islanders, seeing where this conversation was going, cautioned Pemeticom that it would be suicidal for the Wampanoags to resort to arms because they said the English were too strong for them. In that case, Pemeticom retorted, then the English should do to them, the Wampanoags, as they did when they were too strong for the English. In other words, he called on the English to assume the role of the great man by acting with generosity, restraint, and justice toward the Wampanoag little child. And that's where this conference ended because everyone knew this wish was futile. Just days later, Pemeticom led a Wampanoag force against nearby English towns, prompting a war that would engulf the entire region and ultimately break the back of indigenous power in Southern New England. This terrible conflict is the most basic feature of Wampanoag English relations that the Thanksgiving myth studiously ignores. Initially, Wampanoag resistance fighters got the best of it by repeatedly sacking exposed English settlements and ambushing troops on the march. Furthermore, soon they had the support of the Nipmucks in what's now central Massachusetts, the Narragansetts from what's now Rhode Island, Pocumtucks and Sokokis from the Connecticut River Valley, whom colonists turned into enemies by violating their neutrality, such as attempting to confiscate their weapons. The warring Indians took advantage of these colonial missteps to take the lives of upwards of 3,000 Englishmen, destroy 16 colonial towns, and slaughter 800 head of cattle. Eventually, however, the resistance collapsed, largely, not entirely, but largely because other Native people threw in their lot with the English. And here I want you to focus on this part of the map. Uh, here around the modern day border of uh, Massachusetts and New York. In February of 1676, the Mohawks, the easternmost nation of the Five Nations Iroquois or Haudenosaunee people, as a gesture of alliance to the colony of New York, drove Pemeticom's winter camp away from Dutch and French gunrunners on the Hudson River and eastward back into the teeth of colonial New England forces. So they drive 
the winter camp this direction here. Also lying in wait among the English were the Mohegans and the Pequots of what are now Connecticut and Christian Wampanoags from Cape Cod, who under duress had sided with the colonies from the beginning and were just as adept in forest warfare as the resistance fighters. Meanwhile, the warring Indians and their families were stalked by hunger and disease as they lived on the run away from their cornfields and fishing stations. Consequently, by the late spring of 1676, so about a year into this war, growing numbers of them began to accept an English offer of quarter in exchange for switching sides. Others avoided this terrible choice by escaping to the upper Hudson River Valley or Canada, where they built new lives. But most of them never made it that far. By June 1676, Indian prisoners were telling their English captors that Pometacom, quote, was ready to die, for you have now killed or taken all his relations, and almost broke his heart. Those relations included his wife, Watuna Kanuski, and their son, we don't know his name, who Colin is captured and sold into the horrors of Caribbean slavery. They were but two of the estimated 2,000 Native people, men, women, and children alike, who the English sentenced to slavery and sold throughout the Atlantic world. Some of these poor souls had surrendered based on English promises of mercy only to discover that the terms were harsher than colonial officials had pledged. Worse still, some surrendering natives learned too late that colonial authorities would not spare any native person suspected of having taken an English life. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Plymouth all held public executions throughout the summer of 1676, including 50 hangings on Boston Common alone. Uh, something which this public space still has yet to acknowledge. The English even exacted retribution on the dead. On August 6, colonial forces discovered the drowned body of Weedamu, a female sachem and war leader and the sister of Pometacom's wife. Authorities ordered her head to be severed and piked next to a holding pen full of Wampanoag prisoners. The captives, according to English accounts, and I quote, made a most horrid and diabolical lamentation, crying out, it was their queen's head. A few days after this incident, Pometacom was dead too, shot down by a Christian Indian who the English called Alderman. Filled with a vengeful spirit, Captain Benjamin Church had the sachem dismembered and his head sent to Plymouth. There, on the very site, where the sachem's father had allied and feasted with the pilgrims, authorities mounted their grisly trophy outside the town gate and left it there to rot for the next 20 years. It is likely one of the very last things that Pometacom's wife saw when Plymouth shipped her from her homeland into slavery. Later that week, Plymouth held a day of thanksgiving in praise of God for saving the colony from its enemies. Though history rarely pays attention to the Wampanoags after King Philip's War, my book emphasizes that this conflict was just the first stage in a centuries-long battle to defend their land and sovereignty. It should come as no surprise that the English seized nearly all of the Wampanoags' territory in the decades after the war, leaving only a handful of town-sized reservations for mostly Christian Indians. Less well-known, is that the English also seized the Wampanoags as bound laborers. From the late 1600s through the early 1800s, merchant creditors, courts, and government appointed guardians colluded to force the Wampanoags and their children into indentured servitude to white farmers, householders, and whaling merchants, with the terms often lasting for several years and even decades. So many Wampanoag children wound up as servants of the English that few Wampanoags could speak their ancestral language by the mid-19th century. For such reasons and more, in 1836, William Apis, 
a Pequot who served as preacher to the Mashpee Wampanoags on Cape Cod, wrote what he called a eulogy to King Philip, in which he proposed that Massasoit's welcome of the Mayflower passengers was a grave mistake. Therefore, William Apis contended that Indians should treat every December 22nd, the anniversary of the Pilgrims landing in Plymouth, and every 4th of July as what he called days of mourning and not joy. Let them rather fast and pray to the great spirit, the Indians God, who deals out mercy to his red children and not destruction. Despite unyielding assaults on their communities, the Wampanoags stubbornly persisted, which Massachusetts addressed in the late 1860s and 18, early 1870s by dissolving their reservations of Mashpee, Herring Pond, Gayhead or Quinna, Chappaquiddick, Christiantown, and others. The state divided the common lands of these places into private property tracts, subject to confiscation for debt and unpaid taxes. It then declared the inhabitants to be full-fledged citizens and no longer Indians, as if the two were antithetical. White officials refused to listen to the Wampanoags who protested that this supposed gift of citizenship was actually a Trojan horse to rob them of their remaining land and force them to scatter. And that was indeed the point. White proponents of this measure at their more honest moments admitted that they considered the Wampanoags to be too racially intermixed to be classified as Indians any longer. And that in any case, it was the fate, the manifest destiny of Indians to vanish. Over the next century, white Americans did everything they could to make that supposedly natural process occur, including reducing Indians to romantic bit parts in the country's history, as exemplified by the Thanksgiving myth. Now, let me emphasize here, and this will come as a surprise, I suspect, to most of you, throughout the 17th, 18th, and even into the 19th century, Thanksgiving had no association whatsoever with pilgrims and Indians. The link between the holiday and that history appears to date to 1841, when the Reverend Alexander Young published a primary source account of a 1621 harvest feast hosted by Plymouth Colony and attended by neighboring Wampanoags. So here's the document and the famous footnote right here. Uh, trust me, as a historian, there are very few famous footnotes. Um, this is one of them. Um, and this footnote read, uh, the footnote attached to the passage of this feast read, this was the first Thanksgiving, the Harvest Festival of New England. Well, this primary source was widely read, and over the next several years, various authors, artists, and lecturers disseminated Young's idea until Americans, especially in the Northeast, took it for granted. Predictably, New Englanders were the first to tout the pilgrims as national founders and their dinner with Indians as a template for Thanksgiving. For the rest of the country to go along, the nation first had to subjugate the tribes of the Great Plains and Far West. Only then could white people stop vilifying Indians as bloodthirsty savages and give them an unthreatening role in a national founding myth. The Pilgrim Saga also took hold because it had use in the nation's culture wars. It was no coincidence that the Pilgrims emerged as founding fathers at a time of popular anxiety that the United States was being overrun by immigrants, especially Catholics from Ireland and, Ger and Germany, who were supposedly unappreciative of the country's Protestant democratic origins and values. Additionally, treating the pilgrims as the epitome of colonial America served to minimize the country's record of racial oppression, past and present. Better to highlight the pilgrims' religious and democratic principles, instead of the Indian wars and slavery, more typical of colonies, including Plymouth. Through such means, 
Northeasterners could define the so-called Black and Indian problems as Southern and Western exceptions to an otherwise inspiring national heritage. So what I'm saying here is that though Americans today widely assume that Thanksgiving has been associated with pilgrims and Indians since 1621, that tradition was a product of white Northeastern Protestants in the 19th century, asserting their cultural authority over European immigrants, Americans of color, and other American regions. This invention became tradition by the early 20th century, and it has remained so, in no small part through American schools holding annual Thanksgiving pageants in which the students dress up as pilgrims and Indians to reenact the first Thanksgiving. I myself remember participating in one such performance, and I, I was cast as a tree. Uh, but in it, we sang, My Country Tis of Thee, praising America as a sweet land of liberty and the pilgrims as my fathers. The point of this exercise was to have a diverse group of school children learn about who we as Americans are, or at least who we're supposed to be. Even students from ethnic backgrounds would be instilled with the principles of representative government, liberty, and Christianity, while learning to identify with English colonists as fellow white people. Leaving Indians outside the category of my fathers also carried important lessons. It was yet another reminder about which race ran the country and whose values mattered. By 1970, Frank James, our second native revisionist historian, had reached the limits of his patience with this nonsense. James was born and raised in the community of Aquina, or Gayhead, on Martha's Vineyard, which had long ranked among the poorest communities in Massachusetts. Nevertheless, James grew up determined to succeed and represent his people. His inner drive carried him all the way to the New England Conservatory, where he studied trumpet, and then to the Nauset Regional Schools on Cape Cod, where he became director of music. Yet his passion was political activism and the study of Wampanoag history, because he understood that knowing the past was critical to reforming the present. And what he read in the primary sources made his blood boil, because it bore little relation to the Thanksgiving myth that weighed around his people's neck like a millstone. So when James was invited to speak at a state banquet celebrating the 350th anniversary of Plymouth's founding, he saw it as a rare opportunity to set the record straight. Yet when he submitted a draft of his speech for review, white officials rejected it as too inflammatory. James, for his part, found an alternative script drawn up by authorities to be, as he put it, so childish and untrue that he pulled out of the event altogether. Instead, he arranged for a commemoration of his own in which there would be no censors. Inspired by the Red Power Movement for Indigenous Rights and Justice, James organized what he called a National Day of Mourning to be held on Thanksgiving Day, 1970 at the site of the Massas Massasoit statue overlooking Plymouth Rock. In choosing this name, James hearkened not only to National Days of Mourning, held after the assassinations of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. He also reached back to William Apis's eulogy on King Philip. And like Apis incarnate, when James's moment came, he rose up before protesters from all across Indian country, media and onlookers, and delivered that inflammatory speech. He began with the poignant assertion that he had the right to the dignity of his humanity despite society's efforts to diminish him and his people. I speak to you as a man, he stressed, a Wampanoag man. I'm a proud man, proud of my ancestry, my accomplishments won by strict parental direction. Despite his family and community suffering, poverty and discrimination, 
two social and economic diseases. He acknowledged to his white listeners that Thanksgiving, quote, is a time of celebration for you, celebrating the beginnings of the white man in America. For James and the Wampanoags, however, the day had doleful implications. It is with a heavy heart, he explained, that I look back on what happened to my people. James proceeded to tell a history of English Wampanoag relations that turned the traditional bedtime story of Thanksgiving into a nightmare. His conclusion was that Usamequin's welcome to the pilgrims, quote, was perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoags, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing it was the beginning of the end. That before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoag would no longer be a free people. To James, like Pometicom, the moral of the first Thanksgiving was that the English and their white successors betrayed the Wampanoags who had befriended them in their time of need. And this message has echoed through subsequent national days of mourning, which have taken place each Thanksgiving at the very same place right up to this very day. As to the question of how to move forward, James's answer is to confront this history, including the fact, as he put it, that the Wampanoags still walk the lands of Massachusetts. James also urged Americans to consider Native Americans as worthy as the same respect as everyone else. Let us remember, he counseled, the Indian is and was as human as the white man. The Indian feels pain, gets hurt, becomes defensive, has dreams, bears tragedy and failure, suffer, suffers from loneliness, needs to cry as well as laugh. If Americans follow this counsel to extend their native countrymen and women basic compassion and acknowledgement, it would make Thanksgiving Day 1970 a new beginning toward what James called a more humane America, a more Indian America, in which native people could, and I quote again, regain the position in this country that is rightfully ours. There are so many reasons for Americans to try to tell the history of Plymouth and Thanksgiving with three-dimensional Wampanoag people at the center. Thanksgiving is a focal point for considering the Native American role in the nation's past. It's bad enough to have gotten the story so wrong for so long. It's downright inexcusable to continue, with the, continue the annual tradition of having teachers, politicians, and television producers traffic in the Thanksgiving myth, and residential homes and shopping centers sport decorations of happy pilgrims and Indians. These practices dismiss Native people's very real historical traumas at white hands in favor of depicting their ancestors as consenting to colonialism. To call the consequences harmless is to ignore the chorus of Native Americans, our fellow Americans, who say the herd is profound, particularly for their children. In a pluralistic country, it's morally unacceptable to allow the celebration of a national holiday to damage part of the nation's people. Never mind the first people, or for that matter, all of the people. Whereas the identity politics of marginalized groups tends to focus on achieving justice and equality, or in the Native American case, sovereignty as well, white identity politics has always centered on oppressing others. Yet there's been too little public reflection about how the Thanksgiving myth teaches white proprietorship of the nation. Why should a school-aged child with the name of, say, Silverman, identify more with the pilgrims than the Indians. After all, such a student is unlikely to descend from either group, and the descendants of both groups are Silverman's fellow Americans. If the student is taught to think of both the pilgrims and Indians like a historian, more dispassionately as they instead of as we, 
it might be a step towards a more critical understanding of the past in which all of the actors can be seen as more fully human with all of the virtues and shortcomings that one would expect to find in any population. At the same time, if the student is taught to think of both groups more inclusively as we, aware of the associated risk of appropriation, it might be a step toward a more compassionate national culture. If the public continues to associate pilgrim Indian relations with Thanksgiving, and I don't think we need to, the least we can do is try to get the story straight with Wampanoag actors and perspectives at the center. Imagine if instead of trafficking in the mythical Thanksgiving, we as a country reckoned with the story as told by Pometicom and Frank James. Now, I'm not naive. I know the challenges are significant at many levels. A number of Americans are uncomfortable with the Native American past. It tends to turn patriotic episodes inside out and heroes into villains, or at least into deeply flawed heroes. It loosens white claims on morality and authority. It raises political and cultural questions about justice. It threatens to tear down monuments and rename buildings. But confronting this darkness also promises to shed light, cultivate national humility, and most importantly, I think, signal to Native people that the country values them as us. As one gracious Wampanoag uh, elder from Aquino once told me, we do ourselves no good by hiding from the truth. I think she was talking about all of us. Amen. Wow. Well, you certainly uh, gave us a different perspective than we learned in grade school and clearly one more grounded in the reality of what our history is. We've got a series of questions from our audience. And let me start with um, one of our questioners suggested that perhaps James's speech was analogous to Frederick Douglass's speech on the 4th of July about what is the 4th of July to a slave. Um, would you like to comment on that? No, I, I don't know if um, Frank James was uh, aware of that speech. He very well might have been. I mean, it's a, it's a famous speech. But, but here's what I can tell you, is that when Douglass delivered that oration, it was in a broader 19th century reformist milieu that included Native activists, including William Apis, uh, the, the uh, uh, 1830s uh, preacher to the Mashpee Wampanoags. Um, they might very well have known each other, is, is what I'm saying. They certainly had um, uh, some, some of the same contacts. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's a constellation of influences that, that, were weighing, that were bearing on James's speech, and I think you might very well have hit on, on one of them. There's, a, there's an enormous amount of overlap between reformers in the 19th century who are advocating for indigenous people and reformers who are advocating for African-American people. Now, another question is, was this sort of manufactured history um, what was told in the residential schools where Indians were, you know, trans supposed to be transformed into uh, Americans? What a terrific question. Um, I think you've just hit on a topic for one of my uh, next seniors who are lo who's looking for a thesis. Um, you know, here's what I can tell you. Um, there's been an increasing amount of research about the curriculum in these boarding schools. And, you know, suffice it to say uh, that, that that curriculum was steeped in racial ideology, uh, both white supremacy and the, the degradation of, of Native people. Um, how Thanksgiving came to play, I didn't even think to look there. And that's one of the great things about uh, uh, having Q&As like this is it gives me new material to work with. Thank you. We're happy. Um, one of the other questions is, what was the Wampanoag's concept of land ownership? Um, you know, we, we learned that Indians had a different concept. Yep. Had it become more European, you talked about the loss of land. 
Right. So, you know, there's an urban legend that native people had no sense of land ownership. That is just not true. They're, they're not like wolves roving the, the forest as, as uh, the English would have styled it. Um, groups of people, communities and tribes understood fully where their territory began and where their territory ended. And if you wanted to enter and use their territory, you needed their permission. But within that territory, the people held the land communally. Now, certain families might um, grow uh, their horticultural crops, corn, beans, and squash on the same tract of land every year. Um, but if they stopped growing uh, those crops on that land, the land then reverted to the community as a whole. As for uh, fishing places and gathering places and hunting places, those belong to everyone within the corporate group. So the fund fundamental difference between European ways of land ownership and Native American ways of land ownership is that Native people held land communally as a group, whereas Europeans held land privately. Fascinating. Now, one of the questions we have is, um, one of our listeners uh, said that Massasada was in uh, the family tree. Um, and the question was, when did the Wampanoag Indians and the settlers start intermarrying? Do you know? Uh, they almost never intermarried. That's not to say they didn't have sex. <laughs> There's plenty of examples of that almost from uh, the very beginning. Um, but there, to my knowledge, there was only one case on record during the 17th and the 18th centuries of a formal marriage taking place. Um, and what's especially striking about that, and you know, we, we can't say for certain whether it's uh, just the English or the English and the Wampanoags uh, whose values are leading to that lack of intermarriages. I suspect it's the English because native people, not all, but native people widely engaged in intermarriage with their, their foreign allies in order to secure their relationship, their diplomatic relationships. What's especially striking about the lack of marriages between the groups is that a sizable percentage of Wampanoags were Christian. So it's not a religious difference, which was, you know, religion was fundamental to these colonists' sense of identity. But as soon as Native people become Christian, well, then all of a sudden, you know, the standard for who's us and who's them began to shift. And one of, the, I'm, a, I'm a, a scholar of race as well as Native America. One of the, uh, the, the quite clear patterns in colonial American history is that as indigenous people, and enslaved Africans begin to adopt Christianity, the language of race, especially the identity white, begins to supersede the European identity of Christian in the American context. Now, we've got uh, a short time, so I'm going to give you some sort of lightning rod questions. Sure. Um, and one of them is, can you talk about the federal recognition of the Wampanoag groups and when did that happen or did it happen? Right. So, um, right. So <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to make a complex legal process as concise as I, I possibly can. Um, when Massachusetts and other states of the original 13 uh, states dissolved Native American communities on state authority, that was in violation of federal law. Um, the Trade and Intercourse Acts, this, there's three of them in the, in the 1790s, gave the federal government exclusive jurisdiction over diplomacy with Native people. So fast forward to the mid to late 20th century, and Native groups throughout the, the East began to sue the federal government, saying, you know, these states had no right to dissolve our legal identities as tribes and take our land away from us. And the ruling of the courts, by and large, was, yeah, that's ex that's exactly right. Uh, during the Carter administration, the Passamaquoddies of Maine got a massive settlement um, uh, with the state as the first in a string of, of, of these, these settlements. So the Wampanoags followed in this, in this train, and the Aquino Wampanoags were the first Wampanoag community uh, to gain federal recognition. The Mashpees were rejected. Uh, early on. They actually had a court proceeding, a famous, infamous uh, court proceeding in the 1970s in which the court ruled they weren't an actual Indian tribe, uh, which to them was preposterous. Um, that ruling eventually 
got overturned. Um, the Mashpees were gained federal recognition and some of their lands were taken into trust by the federal government. The Trump administration's Department of the Interior tried to dissolve the reservation. Um, and I, I'd be happy to discuss the politics of that if anyone's interested. But recently, Congress overturned that act. Mashpee's reservation has been restored. Um, and you have two federally recognized Wampanoag tribes, which are thriving, let me say. And to what extent uh, is the real history of the Plymouth colony reflected in the restored story? Is there is there an attempt to sort of tell the tell the real story as they well you know, try to make the I would say this the you, you know the, Wampanoag people who I know have a range of opinions on the Thanksgiving holiday and on this history uh, you know on the one hand Thanksgiving season is the one time a year where the greater public pays attention to them. And so, you know, they certainly appreciate if they're also overwhelmed sometimes by the um, by that attention. You know, at the same time, they feel the weight of the way white Americans have sanitized colonial history and ignored Native American history. Um, they feel that very deeply and are, and are resentful uh, about it. So, you know, they have very conflicting opinion about this. This history, the history that I'm telling, let's be clear, I'm not Wampanoag. I'm not telling this history from a modern Wampanoag perspective. I'm telling it from a historian's perspective. And the power intertribal politics and sometimes the ruthlessness of that in, of intertribal politics and Indian colonial relations sometimes also is jar, as jarring to them as the my depiction of colonists is to say to Mayflower descendants. All of us struggle with seeing our ancestors in three-dimensional form because all of our ancestors were complex people who did good things and bad things and behaved in ways that might have been appropriate for the time but are un unfathomable to us. And that's what critical history does, right? As a historian, it is not my job to make people feel good about the past. It is not my job to, for, to make people feel patriotic or unpatriotic. It is only my job to capture a complex past in all of its complexity. And a complex past in all of its complexity tends to upset people of all descriptions. Well, we could continue these questions because we have so many, but we are up against our time. And we want to remind people that this has been video recorded and it will be available so that people can go back and, you know, someone wanted to see your last slide. All of the slides are available uh, in the recording and we hope you'll share it with your friends and neighbors. We, we do this, we're honored to have nearly 200 people with us today live, but we want you to share it with, uh, with others because we are about telling the history. So here's the final question. Um, and I think this is a really thoughtful question. Um, one of our listeners said in, in their family, Thanksgiving is not so much a nationalistic holiday, but a time to give thanks for the blessings that that family has and to recognize um, the good things and you know, really come together as a family. Given what you've just shared and the sort of real story of Thanksgiving, what kind of messages should people be sharing around the Thanksgiving yep. table that is respectful of the Wampanoag? Well, here's what I would say. For over 200 years, white Americans celebrated Thanksgiving without invoking pilgrims and Indians. So if we detach the myth from this wonderful ritual of getting together with family and friends and offering thanks for what's good in our lives, that's far more traditional than trafficking in this myth. Neither I, nor for that matter, any indigenous people I know are calling for a war on Thanksgiving or to cancel Thanksgiving. The message here is that if you're going to attach a story of pilgrims and Wampanoags to the holiday, get the story straight. 
but you don't have to attach the story to the holiday. They're two separate things. So let's continue our Thanksgiving traditions with families and friends and leave this myth to the dustbin of 19th century and 20th century cultural history where it belongs. Well, Dr. Silverman, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your contribution. Uh, we look forward to your continuing scholarship. Uh, you know, as you said, you, you're looking at your next thing. And so we, we hope that we'll be continuing uh, to be in conversation with you. And thank you for sharing your thoughts with our listeners. Uh, we 